This is the first in a series of three webinars we will host on this topic. To begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are gathering this evening in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship, which Mi'kmaq and Maliseet peoples first signed with the British crown in 1725. We are grateful to be treaty people. Knowing there are people with us this evening from outside Nova Scotia, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional and unceded territories where they are located. This webinar series is sponsored by Employment and Social Development Canada, and we are grateful for the support. Before I introduce tonight's speakers, I will say a few words about process. Each of our three speakers will have eight minutes to present. I will ask you, the audience, to type your questions in chat, and as many of them as possible will be addressed in the question and answer period following each of the three speakers' presentations. At this time, I am very pleased to welcome our speakers, Marion Sheridan, Nikki Jamison, and Blair Crawford. Thanks to each of you for agreeing to be with us this evening. Your time and participation is very much appreciated. I would first like to welcome Marion Sheridan to the mic. Marion is a sister of St. Martha here in Antigonish. She has a master's degree in social work and has worked in the field for over 50 years. She worked in family agencies in Sydney, New Glasgow, and Boston. She is a clinical social worker, which includes therapy, education, and advocacy. Marion is creative. She taught ballet to children of color in a housing project in Boston as a way of reaching their families that may have needed some help. She was an initiator of the Antigonish Coalition to End Poverty and the Antigonish Affordable Housing Society. Her congregation is a member of the Sisters of Charity Federation, which has non-governmental organization status at the United Nations. Marion is the liaison for the Marthas and regularly, regularly attends commissions and other meetings as a member of civil society. Motivated by Agenda 2030, no one will be left behind, she tries to integrate the global with the local. Her commitment to and passion for the SDGs is an integral part of who she is. Welcome, Marion. Thank you, Pauline. I also recognize that we're standing on the unceded Mi'kmaq territory. I welcome all who have taken time to be with us on this webinar, including panelists. During my presentation, I will give you a brief history of the SDGs, always keeping in mind that Canada signed on to achieve these global goals. So as Canadian citizens, we too have signed on. We will also reflect on the SDGs and the framework they provide for the work we do in our communities. Blair and Nikki will flesh this out. Um, as Pauline mentioned, I am the NGO liaison for the Sisters of St. Martha with the Sisters of Charity Federation NGO at the UN. As Martha's, we use the SDG framework and Agenda 2030 in our governance and our ministries. We advocate with our member of parliament and the permanent mission of Canada at the United Nations. So it's obvious, I guess, why I'm so enthusiastic about this. The SDGs provide a moral compass for our world, which includes governments, civil society, and the private sector. The late UN Secretary General Kofi Annan used to say to civil society, and I was a part of this when he was there, quote, you are the conscience of the world. Do not expect governments to do this. They need you to surface the frontline issues, end of quote. My task as a panelist is to provide some history about the SDGs and their evolution. 
in 2000, under Secretary General Kofi Annan, eight millennium goals were crafted by member states without the active participation of civil society in their countries. These MDGs provided a framework to deal with poverty, hunger, and other problems facing our world. And while some progress was made, one billion people were lifted out of poverty, according to the UN. Many of the MDGs were not complete successes and some failed outright at the local level. The next Secretary General, Ban Ki-moon, along with other UN groups, saw the need to build on the MDGs and this time to ensure there would be a more participatory, inclusive process in, in place to create the global goals. And so the social development goals were initiated at the United Nations Conference on Sustainable Development held in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil in 2012. The purpose was to provide a blueprint to achieve a better and more sustainable future for all that would respond to the current environmental, political and economic challenges that we face as humanity. Ban Ki-moon set in motion a three-year process which encouraged all global citizens to participate. These goals were developed by the people, with the people, not for them, assuring that no one would be left behind. And it sounds to me like an echo of Moses Cody telling people they are to be masters of their own destiny. The result of this three-year process, the 17 UN Sustainable Goals, were unanimously adopted by the 193 member states of the General Assembly on September 23, 2015. They were adopted as a universal call to action to end poverty, protect the planet, and ensure that by 2030, all people would enjoy peace and prosperity. The Declaration of the Human Rights serves as the foundation of the United Nations and the SDGs. The SDGs define the world we want with the assurance that no one will be left behind. This assurance is grounded in the belief that each person our brothers and sisters, is created equal, is unique, and has a right to be treated with dignity. If we forget these underlying values, the SDGs may not live up to that assurance. 17 Sustainable Development Goals with their 169 targets are the backbone of Agenda 2030. They must be viewed considering the current reality where we face challenges. I think we all agree we are living in a fractured world torn by conflict at this moment. Tragically, the COVID pandemic has clawed back some of the earlier successes that the SDGs have really um, shown. We can relate to this more if time permits. It is good to keep in mind that the UN has no legislative power. Any action which is taken by member states is done voluntarily by each member state and requires the political will of duty bearers to take action. Sustainable development goals are not intended to be viewed as silos. Each goal is multidimensional and needs to be understood through that lens. For example, poverty is not just about having enough money, although that is essential. It intersects with many other related goals, such as dealing with hunger, good health and well-being, ed quality education, gender equality, clean water, sanitation, decent work, safe and affordable housing. Depending on the context, some goals may need more emphasis than others at times, but they are always interlinked. 
often at the community level, we may not realize we are contributing to Agenda 2030 through our work in areas such as peace building, food security, clean water, or affordable housing, but we are. Since this webinar is on the SDGs and affordable housing, I will elaborate a little on goal 11, which is sustainable cities and communities. The first target of this goal is safe and affordable housing. The mission statement reads, and I quote, to make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. End of quote. Affordable housing should also be socially, environmentally, and financially sustainable. Improving the quality of life and the development of each person in housing needs to be a priority. I would like to draw, close by drawing our attention to goal 17 about engaging in partnerships to achieve the goals. It is interesting to me to note this is the last of the list of goals, yet it is the key to what we are doing in our communities. The goals provide a framework and our goal is to work together from this cooperative lens. This is not unlike the Martha's call to live interdependently at all times. As Lawrence Hill clearly states, and this has become a real part of myself, and I quote him, we all have the same color blood, end of quote. The SDGs, based on the Declaration of Human Rights and the principle that no one will be left behind, provide us with a moral compass for our world and our work. This can be exciting and hopeful for all of us. The theme of this year's UN General Assembly is hope. As global citizens living in the nation state of Canada, we can contribute in our own areas of action to making 2030, Agenda 2030 a success and to improving the quality of life for all we meet. Thank you. Thank you, Marian. I really appreciated hearing you talk about how the sustainable development goals were formed by the people for the people and that the 2015 adoption of the sustainable development goals is truly a call to action to all of us uh, to, to look at our work through the lens of ending poverty, protecting the planet and ensuring that the same opportunities exist for all people in our world. It also really struck me when you talked about how we don't necessarily in our, in our communities, in our organizations, in our groups, know that we are carrying out the work of the sustainable development goals, but in the work that's happening at the grassroots, we are all really contributing to the achievement of these goals. And finally, I think it's gonna stick with all of us, the reminder from Lawrence Hill that we all have the same color blood. That really, that really stands out for me. Thank you so much. Before we move to our next speaker this evening, I just want to draw attention to the fact that we have people joining us from across Nova Scotia, and we also have people with us in the webinar from British Columbia, as well as Yellowknife. So it's great to have a nice wide audience uh, for this evening's uh, presenters. And we really appreciate all of you tuning in. Having said that, I would now like to welcome our next speaker, Nikki Jamison. Nikki is a provincial coordinator for the Atlantic Council for International Cooperation. ACIC is a coalition of individuals, organizations, and institutions working in the Atlantic region to build and model just, equitable, and sustainable communities, both locally and globally. She is also a director on two local housing boards, a nonprofit housing cooperative, as well as an emergency transition house. 
She has a degree in political science and is currently a master's candidate at Acadia University in the same field. Nikki is dedicated to elevating, elevating and incorporating lived experiences into meaningful policy that works for people. Drawing on the intersections of her own economic, social and political identities, she strives to deconstruct common understandings beyond language in all her work. She believes that art, community and collaboration critically inform the narrative of organizations, advocacy and policy and good policy that incorporates this can have transformational impact. Nikki, the mic is yours. Thank you for that introduction. And thank you, Marion, for setting the stage. Uh, it was very helpful to put it into context. Uh, so I'm hoping to kind of build off of that uh, a little bit and talk about how we can get from these broader goals uh, as just more of a touch point and into actual policy that works for communities as we work towards building uh, and modeling these communities, both locally and globally. So using them as a shared global vision can help us initiate conversations and help us co-create solutions uh, for tangible collaboration and actionable goals. But then the question becomes, how can we translate these goals from these large macro ideas down to a localized and even micro lens? And then expanding on that, how do we advocate and ensure that they're measured, reported, and implemented in ways that are effective, equitable, and meaningful? So transla translating broad goals into impactful policy is not a small feat, but it is an achievable one. One that I think that we have to imagine in three different ways. So first, we need a radical restructuring of the narratives that underpin our common perceptions and attitudes toward change. Two, we need a critical evaluation between what we view as individual versus government responsibility. And three, we need to strengthen community initiatives and build capacity on the ground. For any large scale change to work in a meaningful way, I think these three components need to work in tandem. And for the SDGs and Agenda 2030, it's no different. For the sake of this discussion though, and tying them in, I'm gonna focus on the second one, individual versus government responsibility, and how we can think about the SDGs in the context of social policy. So on a micro level, we actually have a really robust document that was published locally that outlines 10 critical components to transform social policy in Nova Scotia, but it actually applies to all social policy broadly. It's called the social policy framework. Um, and the guiding principles to ensure any policy is comprehensive, and meaningful uh, are, there's 10 of them. I will share the link in the chat after uh, if you can't keep up with all 10 that I'm saying, um, but they're interconnectedness, decolonization, social inclusion, universality, climate justice, decent work and well-being, public provision, fiscal fairness, shared governance, and democratization. So as though you can likely see the interconnectedness of those 10 guiding principles and the SDGs more broadly, I'm gonna briefly go through them and just show how they can bring change, specifically the five goals that the Build Together Project intends to highlight. So goal one, no poverty, goal three, good health and well-being. goal seven, affordable and clean energy, goal 10, reduced inequalities, and goal 11, sustainable cities and communities. So as has become abundantly clear, uh, the pandemic has not only exacerbated the cracks in our foundation and revealed some of our very deep flaws we've been trying to highlight for years, it's also shown us that snap policies, reform and substantial changes can be made on the fly when they're prioritized. We have the capacity to adopt and establish structural reforms through transformative policy. We just need the political will to make it happen. We also know from recent reports that not only can we afford to eliminate and address poverty, specifically in Nova Scotia, we actually can't afford not to. It's cheaper for us to make these investments into people than it is to watch people continuously fall through the cracks. So with this, I think if we snap back to think about the broad concept of housing and accommodation, um, the reason that we're all here, through the lens of a social policy framework, I think we can start to notice that as we answer these questions on these 10 guiding principles, we're actually fulfilling and moving towards the concept in Agenda 2030 more broadly. So with interconnectedness, for example, we know that housing cannot be approached from a silo. We can't approach the housing crisis in a meaningful way without also addressing insufficient wages, access to childcare, public transportation, the list goes on. Access to safe, affordable, secure housing is interconnected to a multitude of policy issues and the lack of access has far reaching implications on individuals capacity to participate in other elements of society. 
Addressing these components alongside housing policy helps move us towards reduced inequality, no poverty, sustainable cities and communities, good health and well-being, and so many other of the goals that we're here to talk about tonight. So as you can see, these, these ideas start to kind of work in tandem with each other. As for the guiding principle, decolonization, we need to start asking questions like, what can housing policy that addresses the legacies of colonialism look like? And how can we incorporate the 94 calls of action into our solution? Do our policies include infrastructure with affordable and clean energy? What about clean water and sanitation? Going back to the goals again. We also know that a lack of access to housing has known connections to white supremacy and alt-right organizing. So how can we use these connections to help guide our work? Moving on to social inclusion, what are we doing to support policies that directly impact our most vulnerable community members? Are we supporting and prioritizing housing for newcomers, 2SLGBT folks, folks with accessibility barriers, children that we know have disproportionate rates of poverty here in Nova Scotia? These communities are most likely to be housing insecure. And then flipping back to that interconnectedness piece I just touched on for a minute, it's critical to remind ourselves that it's not enough to simply acknowledge this and prioritize their access. We need to continuously consider the pervasive systemic barriers that prevent communities from accessing housing to begin with. Systemic discrimination results in precarious employment, persistent wage gaps that make affordability impossible for so many, and other barriers that compound and result in this crisis that we're currently seeing. Community groups are doing this work on the ground. We just need to find them and work together. As for universality, it's a good time to remember that the UN Declaration of Human Rights declares that housing is a human right. Access must be universal, regardless of income. And to do this, we need massive public investment in regulation. Thinking about climate justice, we need to ask questions like, how are we ensuring that housing is built in sustainable ways, ways that incorporate technologies and systems for affordable and clean energy? What does this look like when we think about the inclusion of green spaces and communal space? What materials are we using? How are they transported? Where are we sourcing it? There's so many pieces that go into creating these policies that are more than just how do we provide access to housing or how can we, how can we build this infrastructure? Decent work and well-being, for example, is twofold when it comes to policy. First, we need to consider and ensure investments into the workers that build, manage, and advocate for housing and ensure that they have access to decent living wages and safe and decent work. But also, if we look at the intersection between housing insecurity, low wages, lack of access to paid sick days and benefits, and how this impacts overall well-being, we can see that a living wage for all is a critical component not only to increase access to housing, but to maintain it. Not being able to afford basic necessities due to inflation, price gouging, and the increased cost of living impacts folks' well-being. Not being able to take time off work impacts folks' well-being. Not having access to benefits impacts folks' well-being, all of which impacts folks' ability to work, which impacts folks' ability to afford housing. This vicious cycle continues and makes folks housing insecure over and over and just reminds us how important it is to not address these issues in silo and why we need to work together across community groups and across the sector. Building off this and moving into public provision, it's clear that what we've been doing is not working. We are living in the midst of a complete market failure and it's time for policies that are brave enough to reference it for what it is. We need major investment into cooperative, non-market, not-for-profit and other forms of public housing. An almost complete reliance on the private sector continuously moves us away from equity by basing access on affordability and it emboldens narratives around who or is or isn't worthy of access. And then speaking of funding, we can move to fiscal fairness. And it's worth remembering in 1982, 6,500 cooperative homes were built. And in 2020, that number was fewer than 500. We do have the capacity to do this again and more. We just need to mobilize and empower folks to be asking the right questions and demanding accountability from the right people. The federal budget, for example, uh, had recent investments into co-op housing as one example, uh, and they are substantial. It's exciting to see them, but it's still important to remember that they still rely on this competitive characteristic where not-for-profit and housing associations must continue to fight for grant funding and access. So even with this increased public spending, we're still not building a system. We're still leaving it up to not-for-profit and charities to kind of pick up this slack that uh, the government's not providing. Um, and then thinking about shared government, whose responsibility is this? What does housing policy look like through a provincial lens? What kind of funding are we demanding from the federal government and what is required? And then how can municipalities really come together to support this work? And importantly, democratization is the last. Decisions about all of these questions cannot be made without meaningful consultation and collaboration with those impacted and those on the front lines. We must involve community, researchers, advocates, folks in the sector and government bodies in transparent, engaging and ongoing ways.
So now that I've gone through the 10 principles briefly, I think that you can see if we build social policy that considers and is formed by these principles, we're immediately making direct connections to the concept in the SDGs. And if we wanna see real demonstrable, impactful, measurable, tangible changes, we need to demand and uh, government assume responsibility and create space for these changes to happen. We can do it and we have been doing it on the front lines as not-for-profits, as charities, as with community groups for a very long time, but we cannot do it alone. Time and time again, research consistently shows positive correlations between public spending and rising GDPs and the overall health of society. It is critically important that we not sit back and tolerate policies rooted in austerity, but that we come to met together and demand radical action and hold those in power accountable to the creation and expansion of the community housing sector through policy change, living wages, social programs, and addressing the deep-rooted systemic barriers that got us here in the first place. I think that was a lot, but if there's one takeaway that I hope everybody gets from this, I just want to be very clear. Houselessness and a lack of affordable housing is a completely avoidable systemic disaster, and I think we need to start naming it as such. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. Wow, I have never heard such a, a thorough synopsis of social policy framework in such a short period of time. You really packed a lot into, into your presentation and thank you so much for doing so. I think it was incredibly helpful how you talked us through the translation of broad goals into tangible pieces and pointed out that our social policy framework and the 10 guiding principles really can be a tremendous tool for thinking about the sustainable development goals, thinking about the relation to affordable housing, and thinking about how we can work toward policy and measures to see whether or not we're actually moving in the right direction uh, toward impacting positive uh, systemic change that will, will help alleviate this issue in the long term in a sustainable manner. So thank you so much for that. That was, that was tremendous. And I am sure that there are probably lots of questions bubbling up for people. And I would encourage you to keep placing those questions uh, or to start placing those questions in the chat. We will hear from one more speaker and then we will open the floor to you folks uh, through chat uh, to hear what some of the things are that are on your mind uh, as we listen to our presenters tonight. Without any further ado, however, I would like to invite Blair Crawford to the mic. Blair is the Sustainable Development Goals Program Director with Engage Nova Scotia, an independent nonprofit organization whose focus is a vibrant, inclusive, and resilient province. In their work, Blair oversees the coordination of a three-year initiative that seeks to advance the UN SDGs in Nova Scotia. Blair is a recent International Development Studies graduate from McGill University and is the vice chair for Futura 20, an organization that convenes voices around the challenges and opportunities facing Canada with the aim of designing creative approaches and solutions. Welcome, Blair. Thank you so much. And, and thanks, Marion and Nikki, for uh, kicking us off. I, I find the context incredibly helpful, even though I do work with the SDGs every day and Nikki, broad strokes of what you covered, I'll be uh, digging into a bit as well, but perhaps from a data perspective, just give me three seconds to share my screen because as I say, I'm gonna talk about data. I know it's really helpful for folks to be able to kind of see pieces of that. So bear with me as I pull that together. Can you all see my screen right now? Great, all right. Well, um, yeah, thanks so much. During my portion of this conversation, I'm gonna be talking a bit about how the SDGs are showing up in a Nova Scotia context within that uh, bit of a specific focus on affordable housing. Uh, and as maybe was a bit alluded to at the onset, um, in my role at Engage, I oversee a three-year initiative that seeks to first, raise awareness of what the SDGs are, but in a Nova Scotia context. So not only what are the goals, but how do they show up specifically here in this province? And then the second thing that we are kind of focusing on doing is actually supporting more Nova Scotians to work towards advancing the goals here at home. 
And through the work that I feel really lucky to be a part of, it's becoming more and more clear to me that there's a ton of incredible work happening across the province that is advancing the SDGs, even if we don't always use that SDG language, uh, like Marion had kind of mentioned. I want to give you an example of that. So I'm lucky to get to work with a group called Proud Pairs, which is a one-on-one -on -one mentorship program that connects 2S LGBTQIA plus youth and adults all across HRM. The main goal of that programming is really to improve youth mental health, um, but also reduce internalized homophobia, biphobia, and transphobia. And that on its own is incredible work, but sometimes when we would look at that through the SDG lens, we can actually say that this program contributes to goal three, good health and well-being, by working to improve the mental health and social well-being of youth. But also goal 11, sustainable cities and communities, by working to improve folks' sense of belonging to community, which we know is a really important something when thinking about affordable housing as well. And I definitely don't have enough time to even start to talk about all the incredible people and projects that are working towards the goals in this session, but I thought I'd maybe share with you folks a few resources that really highlight some of that excellent work that is happening across the province and also uh, give us a little bit of a peek into affordable housing in Nova Scotia. So the first uh, resource that I want to share with you is this uh, crowdsource interactive map that we built out at Engage. And it'll show you a variety of different organizations, projects, resources, and individuals who are advancing the SDGs in Nova Scotia. Uh, you can actually, on this map, filter by the specific goals that you're interested in, and also then be able to learn more about what kind of work is happening in your community that's advancing the SDGs. Um, and maybe a bit of a plug, you can also add yourself to the map, uh, your organization or your project as well. And as you can see, the map, it's, it's building out, but there's a ton more work uh, that is happening across this province that isn't shown here. So uh, feel free to add yourself. I'll, I'll drop the link at the end of my uh, chat here. The second resource that I'd like to share with you, and it'll build on a bit of what I'm talking about uh, down the line, is more of a data-based resource that's uh, linked to the SDGs in Nova Scotia. Uh, the resource that you're seeing two screen grabs from is called Survey Snapshots, and it takes the 2019 Nova Scotia Quality of Life Initiative data set, which I'm gonna deep dive into in a little bit, and actually maps it up against those targets and indicators that Marion was mentioning that are coming out of the UN SDG framework, with the goal to present local Nova Scotian data that can speak to those goals. So for example, if you're particularly interested in goal one, no poverty, then you can see uh, in this resource how many Nova Scotia residents were unable to pay their bills on time, to pay their mortgage or rent on time, to afford the things that they needed, and to afford necessary transportation at least once during the year leading up uh, to the survey. And with that kind of uh, background as a something, I'd like to just go into a little bit of a deeper conversation about the SDGs and affordable housing. And I, I mentioned, I'm gonna be talking uh, about data. So all the numbers will be there for you to follow along with. Uh, and all the data that I'm sharing with you today, we like to think of as stories because those are people's perspectives and, and their first voice stories that just get presented in, in the language of data. But they come from the 2019 Nova Scotia Quality of Life Survey, which uh, is the largest quality of life data set in North America and was something that was administered by Engage back in 2019. Uh, the survey itself asked 230 distinct questions to try to get a deeper sense of what matters most to Nova Scotians when we're thinking about our quality of life. And we were lucky to reach just shy of 13,000 responses. Uh, for your reference of what those 230 questions could kind of look like, here are some of the general categories, or we call them the eight domains of well being that guide the questions that we ask. So looking at things like the environment and time use, democratic engagement, and living standards, where of course, we'll see um, affordable housing coming out. So into that housing data, uh, through the survey, we found that 22.3% of Nova Scotia residents spent between 30 to 50% of their annual household income on housing. And on top of that, 4% of Nova Scotia residents spent over 50% of their annual household income on housing. And as many of you may know, 30% uh, of your income spent on housing is the threshold indicator for housing affordability in Canada based on the shelter uh, cost to income ratio that was set out by the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Cooperation. So what that means is that over a quarter of Nova Scotia residents 
26.3% uh, to be exact, did not have access to what would be considered affordable housing in 2019 based on that 30% uh, threshold. And in the Anaganish area in particular, or the B2G postal code is how we can break that up. Uh, we learned that 28.3% of residents had spent over 30%, so 30 all the way up to potentially 100 percent of their annual household income on housing. Uh, that's a rate that is slightly higher than the provincial average and it's quite jarring at that. And beyond those numbers, we can actually get a little bit deeper from a data perspective into the experiences and, and perspectives of folks who don't have access to affordable housing uh, through a database tool that we developed and engaged called Spotlight. And I thought I'd just give you a little bit of a 101 on how Spotlight works before showing it to you so that it's not as overwhelming. Uh, but essentially the spotlight tool visualizes how different demographic groups or regional areas or other factors like personal characteristics would differ from a provincial average for a variety of questions. Uh, and the differences from that provincial average are shown on a color gradation from dark purple all the way through to bright yellow. Um, dark purple would represent a more concerning experience or perspective. And really at its core, this tool is more of a sensing tool that highlights patterns and points of interest in our data set. You will see on the next slide some numbers within each of those colored boxes, uh, but I would say they're not the most important piece of information for a non-research brain uh, like myself. But if you are interested in them, these numbers essentially show on average how much the group that you're looking at differs from the provincial mean. And you can see, we tend to see a difference from about negative 1.5 in your darkest purple to about positive 1.5 in the brightest yellow. And we would consider anything uh, between the negative 0.2 to positive 0.2 range to be notable. Um, you'll also notice that uh, there's those colors along the bottom. That is how we color coded the eight domains of well being, and we can organize the survey. And what I'll say when you, when you see that next slide is uh, you can pay attention to those colors and you can start to sense into the themes of notable concerns for different groups of folks. So here is a, a spotlight that we pulled for Nova Scotia residents who spent more than 30% of their income on housing. And uh, I'll try to go slow through this. What we can see is that those folks tend to struggle to afford basic necessities such as food, transportation, paying bills and other things that they need. Also having access, uh, or sorry, have difficult accessing uh, recreational or cultural programs due to the financial barriers that are associated with that. These folks also experience higher degrees of time pressure, which would include not having enough time to prepare or eat healthy meals, to sleep or rest, to socialize or sustain other serious relationships and also to just do chores or, or errands, basic daily tasks. Um, folks with, uh, who are spending more than 30% of their income on housing also tend to have lower trust in others, uh, which would include people in their neighborhood, people that they work with, or people that they go to school with, and uh, perhaps not surprisingly, have lower confidence in institutions. Uh, but most specifically we see coming up are the police uh, system and the justice system. Beyond that, some other key concerns that we see coming up, and you'll see three stars just pop up on your screen, um, is that folks living in Nova Scotia who spend more than 30% of their household income on housing have substantially lower overall life satisfaction, substantially lower self-assessed mental health, and tend to have a lower sense of community as well compared to the provincial average. And recall at the, at the onset, I said that anything uh, over negative 0.2 is considered a notable concern for us. And that top line there is negative 1.4. So that is, uh, and the max can be negative 1.5. So that is uh, a quite notable concern, uh, I would say. And really what I'm showing you here is just a snippet um, from the group of folks who, had ident who uh, spend more than 30% of their income on housing. And I know that, for many folks, these findings and stories don't come as a surprise, uh, but what they do show to me, and I think this ties into what Marion and Nikki were saying, is how intertwined affordable housing is with other measures of well-being and our quality of life. Uh, it's really reiterating the importance of actually taking that holistic approach to thinking about affordable housing in Nova Scotia, like Nikki mentioned. Um, and I think this is where that SDG framework really feels like it can, can tie in for me. 
Uh, as we heard from Marion, the SDGs are really trying to remind us that our greatest global struggles can't be addressed in isolation from one another. Um, and actually, if we're making progress on one of those goals, inevitably, we're going to be benefiting the achievements of others in some way. So when we're thinking about approaching affordable housing in Nova Scotia, um, I think it's crucial for us to kind of take that step back and think about all the different systems that feed into and loop around housing as well, um, such as root causes of poverty, what we're seeing here, how time adequacy and trust in institutions also play into this as a something. And I think when we do that, when we slow down, when we take the step back, when we, when we make those references, we have the opportunity to address that major issue facing over a quarter of Nova Scotia residents, which is access to affordable housing, but also have the chance to improve the quality of life of all people who uh, live on the lands in this province. So I'll stop now. I know that that's a bit of a data overload and always happy to uh, jump into these things a bit deeper as well, if folks have questions about them. Thanks so much, Blair. My goodness, it was really helpful to see how, <clears throat> excuse me, you took you took the 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 framework of the sustainable development goals and showed how it's showing up in the quality of life data in Nova Scotia. So so once again, you've helped to take this very this very global policy or global framework and bring it right down to the grassroots level in Nova Scotia, and to see how the work that we're doing um, is really working toward the achievement of the goals, but it's really working in addition to, to help strengthen um, the fabric of our communities in a way that hopefully it leaves no one behind. So thanks so much for that. All three of you have brought such, such unique and yet complementary uh, perspectives to this, this discussion. It's really, really helpful for, for our listeners this evening, I'm sure. I think we've got time for some questions and I'll, I'll, I'm just gonna pose one immediately. And the question is for you, Nikki. And while, while you're listening to this one, I'll then take a look in the chat to see if other questions are, are being posed for, for you and for others. So the first question is, thoughts on how we can get more transformative thinkers to run for both municipal and provincial government that is needed to bring about lasting just social policy. So Nikki, if you want to take the first uh, the first response to that, and then we'll see if we have others. Yeah, that's a great question too. I would love to hop in on this. I think I kind of have a little bit of two answers. Um, and it goes back to the first point that I mentioned in the beginning, but just how critically important it is to restructure the narratives that underpin our perceptions and attitudes towards change. Um, because the first part of this answer is, like no matter how many progressive and transformative thinkers we run, if we aren't educating folks on a consistent basis, and if folks aren't informed about the impact that their votes will have on policy, and importantly, how their candidates will impact those decisions, then we're going to continue to see progressives and transformative thinkers run that aren't going to be successful in the long run. Um, so this piece is rooted in a lot of that community work on the ground. Um, and then another really important thing I think to remember is that democracy happens between elections. So it's not just about getting these folks into office and then that's the end all be all and we hope that they do it. Um, I think it's a good time to remind ourselves nobody handed us the weekend or like the eight hour workday, the right to vote, or importantly, as we're seeing right now, the rollout of universal childcare. Uh, people have been advocating for these things for a very long time and it wasn't because somebody in power just decided it was the right thing to do. Um, we do need obviously allies in office, but I think again, it comes back to that education piece and really building capacity on the ground um, and continuing to do, uh, like Marion said when we were talking before this webinar, it's the long game. Um, we need to always be planning ahead and always working towards these things together. Um, so yeah, I guess that was kind of a two part answer, but uh, it's, I think they both come down to the education um, and especially education between elections. So people know uh, what they're getting into. I hope that was a little bit helpful. Oops, sorry, that's great, Nikki. Uh, Marion or Blair, would either of you like to uh, offer a response? If not, we have one, a comment from Stella Lord in chat that I think is related. And Stella is saying, it seems to me the struggle to, to afford necessities is fundamentally linked to income, not so much the other four indicators. Also, did you address source of income? By definition, if you're living on income assistance or employment insurance or a minimum wage in this province, you are struggling. 
and uh, sorry, this is a this is a new thread. But Blair, I think this one might be uh, might be good for you to respond to with some of the research that you found. Yeah, absolutely, and and thanks for the question, Stella. So. Yeah, I completely agree with you that there is certainly an inherent tie to income as a something. Uh, and, and maybe what I'd, I'd like to say that I didn't is that uh, the way that this ties to those four others, so barriers to recreation, time adequacy, and the, the trust and confidence pieces, uh, where we wouldn't say that those are exact causation, but there it's perhaps some correlation there uh, between those some things. Um, yeah, the, the question about addressing source of income. So this, uh, the data poll that you saw here takes into account all levels of income. However, uh, I've been told by our research team that there is uh, enough statistical significance to be able to do this for folks who would be recognized as living on low income, which the number that we've been using at Engage uh, would be living under uh, a whole household under 40,000 uh, for, for an annual year. So that sort of something can be pulled. Uh, it wasn't what indicated or what I share here and happy to uh, kind of reference out how that can happen as well. So I'll drop the uh, email of our research coordinator who is certainly a lot better at the data uh, something than I am who would be able to, to help out on that. But yeah, I think the, the something that we look at when we're talking about those notable concerns is not necessarily to say that uh, the inability to afford other necessities then is the reason why also uh, there's an inability to afford housing, but there's those connections as well between the time that we have and, and how we spend our time could impact the way that we can afford the things we need to. And uh, yeah, maybe just a bit more to that interconnected piece, but really appreciate the question and I will drop those uh, references in the chat as well. Thanks, Blair. Uh, there is a question a little bit further down in the chat about the role of Nova Scotia Health, but there's also a question uh, about um, another project that we here at the university are very involved in. It's called Build Together, and it's about strengthening the community housing sector in Nova Scotia. And so uh, maybe I'll just provide a little bit of information on that project as uh, Penny is wondering, what is the connection between the two? Are, are both of these projects being informed by each other? And how does that open a space for collaboration as we, as we go along this journey together of trying to create more sustainable, affordable, appropriate, accessible housing for people in Nova Scotia? So the Build Together project is one that was initiated by ZANEMEX University. We partnered with the Community Housing Transformation Center which is a pan-Canadian organization that was formed after the announcement of the National Housing Strategy. And it exists to do exactly what its name suggests, to help strengthen the community housing sector across the country. So in Nova Scotia, we are a little, um, I wouldn't say behind necessarily, there are a lot of people doing work on the ground to address housing issues in their communities. We don't have a particular mechanism for working together uh, in the community housing sector. And the community housing sector is comprised of co-op and other forms of nonprofit housing. So in 2021, uh, we put a team of people together here at the university and we did four province-wide engagements talking with people in the community housing sector. And out of those engagements, there were several areas where people identified the need for change. Uh, and this change was felt required to help them do their work better, smarter, faster for greater positive impact. Now, we, we over four province-wide consultations, we talked about a lot of things, but these, these areas of change that, that resonated and came to the top, I'll mention those because they are quite related to the SDG framework. And the changes include the need to build capacity in the sector. So among individual nonprofit housing organizations and to build the capacity of the sector as a whole. And this capacity could happen uh, from a number of different angles, uh, not only capacity to, to uh, do community consultation, community engagement, but also capacity to actually create and manage housing and housing assets, uh, capacity to work together, to collaborate, uh, to manage construction projects, to manage renovation projects, all of these things. So a wide, wide span of capacity building required in order to ramp up 
the work of the sector, so to speak. We heard an awful lot about the need to look at the inclusion of first voice, to end racism and stigma, to look at uh, building equity between rural and urban parts of the province, uh, and to look at the provision of supports and wraparound services for people who require affordable housing in the province. And that was seen as one whole area that we need to see a lot of change in order to see lasting development in the community housing sector. There was a cry for a need for policy development and not just housing policy that includes things like land use and things of that nature, but also looking at policies related to uh, basic income, looking at policies related to uh, sick time, looking at policies that really speak to the systemic causes of, of poverty. And that of course is the very first of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We heard a lot about the need to build the visibility of the work of the sector and to look at how that work is happening to contribute to the sustainability of communities and to, to see that work in a way that it's all building toward a collective change in impact. And finally, we heard a lot about the need to look at how the work of the sector is funded and not just capital funding, but operational funding. In large part, the people who participated in our consultations identified as people who are volunteering to do this work in the sector. And the, by far the smaller, the smaller percentage were actual, actually paid employees in the sector. So I think there's a direct alignment between the kinds of changes that people expressed and want to see in the sector with what we're hearing from the framework of the Sustainable Development Goals. It's also came out very clearly in terms of values that were captured through those four province-wide engagements. And uh, we've, we've noted that as articulated throughout the Build Together project, uh, people believe in diversity, equity, inclusion, the inclusion of first voice in the community housing sector. They believe in equitable access and opportunity for both urban and rural communities. They believe in ending racism and stigma that limits access to appropriate housing. They believe in housing as a human right. And finally, people expressed a belief in providing navigation and support services uh, to people in housing need. So all of these things, I think, show very clear alignment between the Sustainable Development Goals uh, work and the work of the Build Together project. And uh, there are lots of mechanisms for, for um, for interaction and, and dialogue between these two projects. And of course, many of the same people are participating in both. So I think we are opening some collaborative spaces and uh, have an opportunity to keep that work going. I think we've got time for just a couple of more questions. And there is one from Danielle McDonald, who's with the National Collaborating Center for the Determinants of Health. And Danielle is asking, do any of you work directly with public health? Or what role do you see for public health to help develop and build capacity and move towards attainment of these goals? Is there anyone who would like to respond to that question first? I can certainly say that in the Build Together project, we have a tremendous support from health promotion uh, specialists who work with public health and work with mental health and addictions across the province. And these staff people are playing an incredible role in convening communities who are interested in coming together to talk about housing. They play an incredible role in supporting research at the community level. They play an incredible role in terms of getting information out to people. And because they've got a province-wide network, um, they're in quite a unique and strategic position uh, to, to facilitate and foster the sharing of information, uh, the sharing of opportunities to come together and provide just a valuable, a really valuable support uh, to communities, uh, particularly in rural areas, I would, I would venture to say. 
Would anyone like to add to that? Nikki, I think you may have been ready to open your mic. Yeah, I was just gonna say like briefly, I think that it, it's a really good question, Danielle, because like we don't often talk about how critical every SDG is actually linked to health because it's not explicitly stated like as its own kind of like standalone goal. Um, so I, I don't work uh, like for public health as the first part of your question. Um, but I think that like public health has a has a huge role to play uh, in ensuring that the society is healthy enough to engage in community work and the education pieces that are necessary to see the goals through. Um, we can't like folks can't pour from an empty cup and then still participate uh, in some of this work. And as a lot of us know um, here that like working in the not for profit sector and working in the community sector is often thankless, like emotionally laborious. It, it, it's hard work. Um, and folks won't have the capacity to engage in that. Like I'm seeing the conversations happen in the chat and just like acknowledging how dismal our social assistance is in this province. And then looking at that compared to like the average rent rates right now, it's absurd to think that anybody could do anything but be completely stressed out and overwhelmed all the time. Like how do you participate in society uh, when you can't afford literally anything and you also don't have access to a doctor, you don't have access to all of your basic social needs and we're, we're setting we're setting it up in Nova Scotia for this to I mean not setting it up it's been a long time coming just exacerbated by the pandemic um, but I think that it's it's important to kind of fall back and think about the social determinants of health and maybe that's a whole other component that can be brought up in another another webinar and putting those alongside how how we can tie those to the SDGs so while I don't uh, work in public health, I think that's a really, really great question. So I just wanted to like jump in and thank you um, for that. Thank you, Nikki. I think we have uh, we have stirred up a lot of conversation this evening, and I think that's absolutely fabulous. We've got lots of folks contributing comments in chat. We thank you for those. Uh, I'm also noticing that it's 7.59, and I wish we had more time to keep the conversation going, but I think we might have to we might have to end here for this evening. Uh, the good news is we have lots more events coming up and I'm going to talk a little bit about those in just a moment. But before I do, I would really like to take this opportunity to thank our presenters this evening, Mary and Nikki and Blair. My goodness, you have all packed so much into your presentations. You've given us so much to think about. You've made such strong connections for us uh, between the, the global uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and what we can do and how our work locally connects to these. Thank you so much for making that link. And we really appreciate the time that you've taken uh, to share your knowledge and expertise with us this evening. I would also like to thank the people behind the scenes who made this webinar possible. Brian Lazuri, Jenny McDonald and Sue Hawks with the Cody Institute Communications team. They do a fabulous job of getting information out about uh, about events that we're hosting and I really appreciate their efforts to make this happen so, so smoothly and succinctly. I would also acknowledge again, the support from Employment and Social Development Canada and their sponsorship of this event. And I would like to thank all of you for joining us this evening for this important discussion. And I will, as I, as I mentioned, let you know that we have two more webinars planned in this series of webinars on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and Affordable Housing in Nova Scotia. So stay tuned, those will be announced in the next, uh, we'll probably have one a month for the next two months. And we will also be hosting um, four people schools related to the UN SDGs and affordable housing. And a people school is a two hour virtual workshop that starts with the knowledge of the people in the room. We have a resource person who works with us throughout that two hours. It's much more of a workshop format than it is a webinar. So you'll have a chance to talk with other people. And those four web, uh, people schools coming up, we've already had one on affordable housing and poverty in Nova Scotia, but the four ones that remain will focus on affordable housing and health outcomes, affordable housing and environmental sustainability, affordable housing and diversity, equity, inclusion, and decolonization, as well as affordable housing and the role of municipal governments. And these topics were selected based on what we've heard from our engagements across the province in the Build Together 
the Build Together project. So this is an example of where there is intersection happening between the two. And uh, these are all topics that we know are really at the top of mind for many people doing this work across the province at this time. So please stay tuned for those. Uh, we will be advertising them through social media and through email, just as we have this webinar. And without any further ado, I will bring this evening's session to a close. And again, thank you so much for participating. Thank you, Nikki, Sister Marion, and Blair. I'm Pauline McIntosh, and I wish you all a very good evening. Hope to see you next time.